Thank you for listening to Crimatorium, the place where crime resides. Crimatorium can also be found on YouTube. John, middle initial A, Daniels, D-A-N-I-E-L-S. Thank you. You may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, for this specific case, were you personally involved in Rachel Anderson's autopsy? I was not. Did we have a request of you? Yes. And what was that request? Uh, the request was to um, examine uh, the report that was made by Dr. Donald Poyman, who did the autopsy, and... Um, basically review it and uh, testify uh, to Dr. Poyman's observations in court. Now, to be fair, I don't want to speak poorly of Dr. Poyman. Did he have some medical issues and is no longer with the coroner's office? Yes, Dr. Poyman had medical issues and is no longer with the coroner's office. Okay. Uh, and did you have an opportunity to review his documentation, the report, and the photographs that yeah. he took or someone took during his examination? Yes, I did. And did it appear as though he followed that general procedure that you previously outlined for the jury with the external exam and the internal exam? Yes, he did. We have States Exhibit V2 up on the screen. Would you explain for the jury what we're looking at in States Exhibit V2? Uh, we are looking at the upper chest, shoulders, face, and neck of the decedent. Uh, and do we know it's the same, uh, Rachel Anderson, because of that unique number? Yes. Okay. Um, I noticed that the front of her body, or what I would call the front of her body there, uh, appears to be discolored. Can you explain that to the jury, please? Uh, that is liver mortis. At the time of death, all circulation stops. Um, with time, blood in the small blood vessels of the skin and in the organs will settle to the lowest points because of the force of gravity. Uh, as it does so in the skin, it will change the skin first from a faint red to a darker red, ultimately to a dark purple. Um, early on in that process, the blood is still liquid, so uh, you could have someone lying on their back, and if you turn them over, the blood would then follow the force of gravity to the front. Uh, ultimately, liver mortis becomes fixed, and what that means is that the blood in the small blood vessels of the skin uh, coagulates and remains in that position, uh, indicating the position the body was in. So in this particular instance, the jury has seen photographs of Ms. Anderson um, face down uh, or laying on her stomach with her um, arms and legs behind her. Would this be consistent with her being in that position? Yes, it would. I also note um, there is something on her nose. Uh, yes. Can you tell us about that, please? That is an abrasion. An abrasion is a lesion that is caused by something uh, forcibly pulling across the surface of the skin and removing a portion of the epidermis superficial layers. Uh, the red is a small amount of hemorrhage. Um. If there had been something across her nose, like a cord or something like that at the scene, is that mark consistent with that? Uh, yes. Okay. Moving ahead to State's Exhibit V3, can you tell the jury what's in this photograph, please? This is a laceration. Um, a laceration is an injury caused by a blunt force. Uh, it has an irregular edge. Uh, there is um, a margin at the edges of the tissue, which are just described in the autopsy report. Uh, this uh, blunt force injury uh, apparently extends all the way through the, the scalp, uh, as described by Dr. Poyman, uh, down to the uh, bone. So when you say extends down into the scalp, what do you mean? It extends through all the layers of the scalp. 
the skin, and the subcutaneous tissues down to the bone. It is located, by the way, near the vertex of the head, near the top of the head. I was just going to say, you're kind of pointing to the top of your yes. head. So the laceration itself goes down to her yes. skull. Yes. Okay. Um, and you mentioned uh, it being a blunt impact. Blunt impact. How do you know that? Uh, by its appearance and by the description Dr. Poyman gave to me. Uh, his, his description, excuse me, he describes it as there are abrasions on uh, both margins uh, and there is tissue bridging deep within the wound. This, uh, by definition, makes it a laceration. A laceration is caused by a blunt impact of the skin, not a sharp object, but a blunt object. It causes the tear in the skin by stretching the skin beyond its tensile strength, and then the skin tears. So some sort of force with a blunt object to yes. the skin. Yes. Was there any associated underlying injury? Yes. Beneath the scalp, there was uh, a hemorrhage associated with this wound that measured, in the report, two by two centimeters. So bleeding underneath. Bleeding underneath. Was this injury that we see in States Exhibit V3 enough to kill Rachel Anderson? Uh, no. What kind of physical impact could this have had on her? Uh, this could stun, some, stun someone. Um, and I can't really suggest how much it might stun someone, but that's okay. It's a blow to the head. All right. I would like to talk about our next two photographs together, if we could. Um, well, actually, I'll, to make it easier for you, I'll do one at a time. States Exhibit V4. Um, this appear looks like it is her left leg. Yes. Could you let us know what we're seeing in this photograph and what was documented with regard to her left leg? Um, these, this is described as a group of thin erythematous skin depressions. Erythematous is just a medical term meaning reddened skin depressions encircling the ankle and above the ankle. Uh, they're depressed. They're reddened. Uh, they are horizontally oriented, and they're about of a, about a quarter inch in width. Was there any bruising in that area? Um, there is some patchy ecchymoses, as described. Ecchymosis is a word for bruise. You can see some here, and here, and perhaps here. What do the, uh, I'm going to use the non-medical terminology, the red depressions and the patchy bruises on her left ankle tell you about what her heart was doing uh, when those were inflicted? Well, bruises are caused by breaking small blood vessels under the skin, and they will bleed under the skin. Uh, if the heart is beating at the time the force to cause a bruise occurs, a bruise will develop, as we've all seen them, red, red, blue, and eventually disappear over time. Uh, if the heart is not beating, uh, there will be no hemorrhage in the skin because there's no active circulation and there will be no bruise. Moving on to states V5, taking a look at her right ankle. Can you tell us what, if anything, was found there? Again, as described, there's a group of depressed erythematous, that is red, skin depressions. Uh, Dr. Poyman mentions again there's some patchy ecchymoses, and these are primarily horizontally oriented. Patchy ecchymoses, patchy bruises? Yes. Same question about her heart. Still beating in order for that to happen? Still beating in order for that to happen. At the scene, the jury has seen um, that there was a cord around her ankles. Are these marks that we see uh, on both V4 and V5 consistent with something being wrapped around her ankles. Yes. Moving on to States Exhibit V6. And I'm going to go, I'm going to do V6 and V7 together since they both appear to be her left uh, wrist. I'll back up for you, Doctor. Yes. V6. Yes. And the, then V7. These are described as several erythematous lines, again, red 
lines uh, here, here, perhaps here, um, which are depressed and uh, go around the uh, the wrist. Uh, and you had said, I think you used the word. Uh, which which medical word did you use? I missed it. Uh, erythematous. They're reddened. Thank you. Reddened. Uh, same kind of question. Uh, would it be reddened uh, if her heart was not beating? No. V8, I think, is this her right wrist? No, left. Sorry, I can't keep my right and my left together. So uh, would this also be just a different view of those marks you were yes. talking about? Yes, and we can see those marks here and there. And a bruising, an area of bruising here. Okay. V9. This, there's the right hand. Sorry. And it appears to be right hand. And again, these are described as four erythematous lines and skin depressions, that is red lines and skin depressions. And um, on the back of the, of the wrist, there is uh, an erythematous line also. And V10, yes. same kind of thing. Same doing. kind of thing, yes. And again, in order to leave those red marks or bruising, her heart would still have to be beating? It would. Now, again, similar to the ankles, the, the jury has seen some photographs where her hands were bound as well. Are these lines consistent with that? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, I would like to move on to um, Rachel's mouth, if we could. I'm going to look at State's Exhibit V11. Would you let the jury know what we're looking at in V11, please? What we are looking at are the upper teeth and the upper lip and uh, the gingiva of the upper jaw and the upper lip. And is there anything of note in State's Exhibit V11? This is called the frenulum. It is a piece of tissue that extends out like a thin membrane uh, at the top of, of this space. It's very thin, and it can be torn with injury to, to the upper lip. What you see here, though, is it is torn. So some sort of force was applied to this, this portion of the body. Now, do you see any hemorrhaging or bleeding here? There is no hemorrhaging at this site. What, if anything, does that tell you medically? It tells me that when this tissue was torn, um, the deceased did not have any active circulation. Uh, she was dead. Um, if um, there was evidence from the scene that she had... Uh, an object or pantyhose in her mouth. Would that be consistent with that injury? Yes, it could be. Could could be could be other things. Yes. Okay. But because there's no hemorrhage, it would have been after death. After death. How about states exhibit V12? Uh, this is a lower teeth, lower lip, and on the mucosal surface, we see these hemorrhages. Um, what that represents is the lower lip being forcibly um, pressed against the teeth. So uh, you could think of these as bruises on the inside of the lip. They occur uh, when there is active circulation. So uh, pre-mortem, before death? Yes, before death. Um, what kind... I think, I apologize if you said that. What can cause those kinds of injuries? Um, an impact okay. or... Your Honor. Yes. Do you mind if we uh, take a quick break? Not at all. All right. We're going to go ahead and take our afternoon break at this time. The direct examination <coughs> of Dr. Daniels. You may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Daniels, I'd like to move on to um, the back of Rachel's neck, please. Were there any injuries to the back of her neck? There were none recorded. Okay. Uh, was there... Um, well, none. 
Okay. There were no ligature marks recorded. Okay, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Were there any other injuries to the back of her neck? There was one injury to the back of her neck. Would you please explain that for the jury? Um, there was what we call a sharp force injury to the back of the neck, and in fact, it is a stab. We have State's Exhibit V13 up there. Uh, can you use your laser pointer and show us what we're talking about? So this is a, a stab wound. And then it, I'm going to, oh, I apologize. I'm going to move ahead to uh, V14. What is that? This is a close-up of the stab wound. And in this case, you can see it has a slight J shape. And what, if anything, does that slight J shape tell you? Um, that results when a knife blade is inserted or a sharp instrument is inserted into the body and then turned, either being while in or partially withdrawn and turned. It gives that, um, it gives that J shape to the generally one end and usually the blunt end uh, of the stab wound. Okay, um, and were there any corresponding internal injuries for the stab wound? Yes, there were. Can you explain those for the jury, please? Okay, there was a uh, skull fracture on the, in the floor of the skull at the back. The technical term for that area is called the posterior cranial fossa. It was on the left. Um, it's the base of the skull where the cerebellum, the small uh, lobe of the brain, sits. Um, as described by Dr. Poyman, there was a fracture, uh, a linear fracture, and then there was a a nine millimeter by one millimeter rectangular fracture that extended to the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is that opening in the base of the skull that the uh, brain stem and the spinal cord pass through. Uh, Dr. Poyman also indicated that one of the wound tracks uh, passed through the cerebellum, the left cerebellar hemisphere, and that there was a secondary track that went into the internal capsule. Uh, when he means the internal capsule, he's referring to um, the area around nuclei within the center of the brain. So if I understand what you're saying, um, the stab wound that we saw um, in uh, V13 and 14 uh, went through her skull, fractured part of her skull, and yes. into her brain. Yes. Then the portions you described there. Did it also break uh, off a piece of her skull? Uh, there was a portion of that fracture that, uh, that was loose within the skull, yes. And what, if anything, does that tell you about the force? Well, that portion of the, the floor of the skull is, is fairly thick. And it, it, uh, I can't quantify by a number, sure. but it's, uh, it requires a fair amount of force to be able to penetrate the skull. Uh, in that way, and then to be able to break off a piece. That injury, the stab wound to the back of her head and into her brain, was that enough to cause her death? That would be enough to cause her death over time. Tell me what you mean by that, please. Um, the portions of the brain that were injured uh, wouldn't, in my opinion, wouldn't necessarily cause instant death. But unattended, an injury like that would uh, result in uh, the brain's reaction to injury, further hemorrhage, and probably swelling. The, all the constellation of those reactions to injury would ultimately cause death. It could result in unconsciousness, but immediate death, not so much. Okay. Um, now, was there an injury, though, that you did identify as you went through this review that did cause her death? Uh, yes, the, uh, the ligature marks and the compression of the neck and the asphyxia uh, with it would, would and can cause a, um, a, a death on, at a much shorter time period. Okay, let's talk about State's Exhibit V15 then. What does the jury see in this photograph, please? What you're seeing are two um, brown 
ligature marks. He describes this as two groups of yellow-brown skin furrows across the anterior, the front aspect of the neck. The ligature marks consist of a horizontally oriented abrasion that varies in width uh, about a quarter to a half inch. And below that is a second horizontally uh, oriented abrasion. So the first is about here, and then the second seems to go across here with a slight gap. Is there any way for you to tell whether that was one loop or two? Um, no. It could be one loop that then was loosened, slipped upward, and then was tightened again, or it could be two loops. Okay. And was there any corresponding ligature mark, I have to use the right terminology now, to the back of her neck? No, there was not. And can you explain how that might happen? Um, that could happen when uh, the ligature is not wrapped around the neck, but is simply pulled across the front and the sides and then pulled directly backward. That can happen either with it being pulled directly backward or it can happen with suspension where um, the individual is face down and the ligature is being pulled upward. Could things like um, Rachel's hair or if there was an object back there like clothing or pantyhose or something also impact that? Uh, yes, something soft uh, would prevent the ligature from making a distinctive mark. Okay. Moving on to State's Exhibit V16. This Which is this is the left side of the neck. We can see a ligature mark here. We can see another one here. And then V17. Right side of the neck. Again, seeing the ligature marks lower and upper. Uh, both of them ending just below the angle of the jaw on the right side. And are both of those just the sides, the continuation of what we saw on the front of her neck? Yes, they are. Okay. When you, uh, I'm sorry, when Dr. Poyman took a look at the structures of her neck underneath those marks, was there any underlying injury there? Uh, yes, there was. Can you explain that to the jury, please? Okay. Um, when a neck is compressed, by any mechanism, if it's compressed severely, the muscles, we call them the strap muscles of the neck, uh, and the soft tissues can have bleeding within them. Dr. Poyman noted that there was, uh, on the right side of the neck, there was a small amount of hemorrhage at the insertion of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The sterno sternocleidomastoid muscle. You're going to have to spell that. For and right there, yeah. the sternocleidomastoid muscle goes from the mastoid process under the ear, comes down at an angle, and it ties into the clavicle and the sternum. Uh, there is a portion where it ties into the clavicle and the sternum, and there was hemorrhage down at that lower portion of it on the right. On the left side, um, there was hemorrhage again in that same um, uh, same muscle on the left side with more hemorrhage, again, at its lower portions. And in order for both the, the marks that we saw and for that hemorrhage, um, her heart would have had to have been beating, yes. at least initially. At least initially. What, if anything, um, do those marks um, or the underlying hemorrhaging tell you about force? Well, it tells me that there is a certainly sufficient force to compress the, um, to compress the blood vessels. It tells me there is sufficient force to cause small blood vessels in the muscles and the soft tissue to rupture and bleed. Hanging deaths or strangulation deaths or deaths due to neck compression by any mechanism often occur uh, due to the lack of blood to the flow to the brain. Uh, this can occur by squeezing the neck in some way uh, and obstructing the veins, draining the blood from the head. And it, it may take maybe five pounds of pressure at most to do that. Also, the carotid arteries, one on each side, which are sending blood to the brain, can be compressed uh, with, uh, it's generally accepted, between five and ten pounds 
of pressure. In either case, uh, there's a lack of blood flow to the brain, and in a few minutes, the brain uh, becomes anoxic and begins to die. So you mentioned a few minutes there. So in order for, um, without a specific number, it would take uh, minutes for someone to die via strangulation. Well, it, yes, it would, it would take minutes for them to suffer irreversible brain injury. Okay. And that would happen before, obviously, they then die. Yes. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. Now, is there any way for you to tell medically if, so in that situation, we're talking about pressure on the neck for, for that entire time, right? Minutes like that. Yes. Is there any way for you to tell medically if that pressure has been released and reapplied multiple times or even just once? Uh, there are a couple indications. Um, pinpoint hemorrhages above the level of the ligature are noted to occur mostly with release of pressure and then re reapplication of pressure. With that, you can, you can see that uh, with application of pressure, blood flow might stop and uh, pressure will, can build up in the small blood vessels. Pressure is released around the neck, blood flows again, it's reapplied, small blood vessels become engorged again. With that, with a couple of cycles of that, uh, these small blood vessels um, in the skin uh, and, and, uh, and other, uh, in, in the soft tissues uh, will rupture and cause bleeding. And um, can you also see evidence of that in, you said uh, pinpoint hemorrhages. Can you also see it inside the eyes? Yes, you can. Okay, evidence of that um, compression release, compression release. Yes. And did Rachel Anderson show signs of either of those? Uh, yes, she did. Okay, if we may. We have States Exhibit V18. What are we looking at here, please? What we are looking at is a close-up of the left eye. Here's the eyebrow. Uh, this is the inside of the lower eyelid. Um, in the report, this is called the palpebral conjunctiva, and it is engorged with blood. It is hemorrhagic. Uh, what we also see are these little pinpoint hemorrhages throughout this area. Their term, medical term for that is petechial hemorrhages. They're pinpoint, uh, and in this case, are a result of small blood vessels breaking in the skin because of the pressure of blood flow being backed up by compression of the neck. Okay, and then uh, moving on to V19. This is the upper outer portion of the left eye. You can see the conjunctiva on the surface of the eye is congested and that there's hemorrhage under the upper eyelid. Now you mentioned congested. What does that mean? The uh, blood vessels are overfilled with blood. Now, can that happen? Is there a way to tell whether or not that was before or after her death? The congested part. The congested part. Um, someone face down can have some congestion of the conjunctiva, that, okay. that lining over the eye. Okay. I just want to make sure we're being clear. Right. You also pointed to a darker area. Uh, of oh, hemorrhage. Sorry. Here. Yes. And that so, is similar to the area under the left, under okay. the lower eyebrow, uh, and eyelid. Is that area that's underneath that you just pointed to, underneath her top eyelid? Thank yes. you. And the part that was on the bottom. Yes. Are those different than congestion? Um, yes. And can you, um, I know you talked about the blood vessels bursting and things like that. Um, so would those other injuries, not the congestion, have been before she died? I would believe so, yes. Okay. And then on her other eye, do we see the same kind of evidence? Yes. It's less pronounced, but under the lower eyelid, we see similar uh, hemorrhages. And those hemorrhages, not the congestion, and the petechiae around her eye, um, are those consistent with what you previously explained for the jury of the compression release, compression release. They would be consistent with a mechanism like that, yes. Okay. Um, are they consistent with uh, struggling? 
Yes. Dr. Daniels, was there also um, a toxicology screen completed? Uh, yes, one was completed. Is that done in every case? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Um, and were there any results of significance in her toxicology screen? Of significance, no. Okay. She had a, maybe a little bit of marijuana in her system. There was, and some marijuana metabolites and an extremely low level of ethanol, that is drinking alcohol. Okay. Are either the level of um, marijuana or the metabolites or the alcohol anything that would have incapacitated her? No. Okay. Um, and when Dr. Poyman went through the rest of the examination of Ms. Anderson, did he identify any other kinds of conditions or naturally occurring medical illnesses that could have caused Rachel's death? No, he did not. Can you let this jury know, please, what did Dr. Poyman rule as the cause and manner of Rachel's death? Um, Dr. Poyman ruled cause of death to be stab wound of the head and neck and manner of death to be homicide. Okay. Now, I think you maybe flipped those a little bit. Can you tell me about that? Well, um, on the death certificate, there is also a section called other significant conditions. Um, in, in toto, Dr. Poyman said, cause of death, stab wound of the head and neck, other significant condition, ligature strangulation, and manner of death, homicide. Uh, between pathologists, we often may disagree on small points. Um, if I had done this case, I might have reversed stab wound and ligature strangulation uh, in their positions, um, but they're both significant. Um, and then, uh, what was what was the manner ruled then? The manner is ruled homicide. Okay. And then you had mentioned you might have flip flopped, but ultimately um, those main findings, the stab wound and the ligature, um, were but, those findings consistent with your review of his? Oh, absolutely. And and again, they're both significant findings. All rise for the jury. It's my understanding that you have reached a verdict. No. All right. Ms. Harper, please. Count one, guilty. We, the jury, being duly empowered and sworn to find the defendant, Anthony Pardon, guilty of aggravated murder as he stands charged in count one of the indictment. Specification two, further, we find the jury, we, the jury, having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count one, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated burglary. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification three, furthermore, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count one, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit kidnapping and the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification four, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count one, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit rape, and the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification five, we the jury having found 
Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count one. Find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated robbery. And the defendant personally committed to each act which constituted aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson and what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count two, guilty. We, the jury being duly impounded and sworn, do find the defendant, Anthony Pardon, guilty of aggravated burglary as he, star- as he stands charged in count two of the indictment and what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count three, guilty. We, the jury being duly impounded and sworn, do find the defendant, Anthony Pardon, guilty of aggravated murder as he stands charged in count three of the indictment. Specification two. Having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count three, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated burglary. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification three. We, the jury, having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count three, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit kidnapping. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification four, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as he stands charged in count three, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit rape. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification five, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count three, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated robbery and the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson and what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count four, guilty. We, the jury being duly impounded and sworn, do find the defendant, Anthony Pardon, guilty of kidnapping as he stands charged in count four of the indictment and then what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count five, guilty. We, the jury, being duly impounded and sworn, do find the defendant, Anthony Pardon, guilty of aggravated murder as he stands charged in count five of the indictment. Specification two. We, the jury, having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count five, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated burglary. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification three, we, the jury, having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count five, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit kidnapping. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification four, We, the jury, having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count five, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit rape. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification five. We, the jury, having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count five, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated robbery. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. And again, what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict, uh, count six, guilty. With the jury being duly impounded and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of rape as he stands charged in count six of the indictment and what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count seven, guilty. We, the jury being duly impounded and sworn, do find the defendant, Anthony Pardon, guilty of murder as he stands charged in count seven of the indictment. Excuse me. 
specification two, with the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count seven, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated burglary. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification three, with the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count seven, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit kidnapping. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification four, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count seven, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit rape. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification five, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count seven, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated robbery. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson and what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count eight, guilty. <coughs> we the jury being duly impounded and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of robbery as he stands charged in count eight of the indictment and what appeared to be 12 signatures. Verdict count nine, guilty. We the jury being duly impounded and sworn to find the defendant Anthony Pardon guilty of aggravated murder as he stands charged in count nine of the indictment. Specification two, we the jury have found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count nine, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated burglary. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification three, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count nine, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit kidnapping. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification four, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count nine, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit rape. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson. Specification five, we the jury having found Anthony Pardon guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of aggravated murder as charged in count nine, find Anthony Pardon guilty of purposely causing the death of Rachel Anderson while committing or attempting to commit or fleeing immediately after committing or attempting to commit aggravated robbery. And the defendant personally committed each act which constituted the aggravated murder of Rachel Anderson and what appeared to be 12 signatures and all the verdict forms are dated with today's date. Uh, does anyone wish the jurors to be polled? Yes, Your Honor, on behalf of Kevin Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, all I'm going to do is ask you if this is your verdict, and all you need to do is just say yes or no, okay? So as to juror number one, is this your verdict? Yes. As to juror number two, is this your verdict? Yes. Two, okay, yes. Yes. Juror number three, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number four, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number five, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number six, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number seven, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number eight, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number nine, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number 10, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number 11, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number 12, is this your verdict? Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, this very, very difficult uh, job. Uh, in a moment, I am going to excuse you, uh, but your responsibility to this case continues and remains. Uh, this is likewise, uh, even for the uh, alternate jurors.
Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right, this time, <clears throat> Anthony Park would like to give a statement. All right, uh, like I said, my name is Anthony Park. And, uh, you have heard from a lot of people, family members, the DA, uh, Mr. Dixon, and Mr. Thomas. So now I'd like to give you a chance to hear from me. I really wish we could be young. I really wish this was different. And we was meeting under different circumstances. But I want you to understand this. My mother took the witness stand. She gave testimony. And I want you to understand that she wasn't the best mother. I want everybody to understand that she was not the best mother. But she did what she had to do. My sister, my brothers, they weren't the best. But we did what we had to do. A lot of things you didn't hear, and a lot of things you probably won't hear about me or my family. But I want you to know this. Eric Barton was my dad. I loved my dad, but I hated my dad. Two people made me who I am today, and I blame that on my dad and the system. I was raised by the system, and I was raised by a abusive father. I used to witness my father beat my mother like a dog. And my mother told you she pulled a gun on me one time, and she did. But I always wondered why she never pulled that gun on him and pulled the trigger. Because if anybody ever beat me like that, I would have did it. They say, my sister said my mother left us. She did. She left us too late. I would have been gone. I would have told my mother I would have been gone. Every day I came home, my father found some reason to beat me, my brothers, my, not my sister, but my mother, my brothers. And it just seemed like it got worse and worse and worse. My father beat me so bad one time that the lady next door threatened him to call the police to make him stop. He beat me with a fan belt. Another time he beat me with a pool stick so bad that I got the scars on my back. A piece of the pool stick lodged in my back. And because my grandmother and them were so scared of my father when we got to the hospital, they told everybody that I fell on a stick, and that's how it happened. But every day, it seemed like it just got worse and worse and worse. It just got worse to the back to the point where me and my sister just ran away. We didn't know where we was going. We just ran away. Police found us walking up my road. We didn't know where we was going. We just go run away to get, to get away from it. Just, he, he, he would just, he drink and somebody gonna get it. For no reason, he just, it seemed like he just drank and somebody was gonna get it. And then, they locked my mama up. After they locked my mama up, I went to Foster Home, Franklin Village, the hilltop. I'd have been in every lock up on the hilltop. For some of y'all that can remember back in the day. There wasn't nothing on the hilltop from the hilltop to the top of the hill to Wheatman was lockups. TCY, BYC, TCO. I've been on all, every one of them. And then one day, prison. I went to prison. I looked up and I was going to prison with the big boys. Man, I feel. With the big boys. No more little boy stuff. Big boys. 17. Five foot five, 125 pounds. And like my mother said, I used to box. I thought I was bad. I was tough tone. But nobody do nothing to me until I got the man's feet. And that's when it, everything changed. It wasn't, it, 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 Mansfield was a place that, that, that you just, you had to be there. You had to actually be there. And I know some of y'all have seen the movie Shawshank with Morgan Freeman. 
The way they prayed that prison, that's how it was in Mansfield. That's just how it was. When you walked through the gates, you was a big boy. You wasn't a little boy no more. Did nobody care I was 17? Did nobody care I was the youngest person there? Did nobody care I was the smallest person there? All I was was a victim. And somebody was going to pray. And it didn't happen. And just when I thought it couldn't, it, 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 it couldn't get no worse, Lucasville. That's the worst of the worst. Lucasville. I learned how to be everything I am in Lucasville. People talked about knives and shanks. In Lucasville, you was going to get a shank or you was going to get shank. That's how it was. Like, I make, no, I make no, no apologies for it. I had to adapt to where I was. Again, wasn't no little boys there. You was a grown man. A grown man. Three shadows. Screams. Everybody walking by. Nobody stopped. Officers turned a blind head. They didn't care. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that day. It was 1995, December 22nd, right before Christmas, 1995. I mean 1985, excuse me. 1985, right before Christmas. Them screams, them people walking by, them three shadows, them people in the safe doing what they was doing to me. Did anybody care? No. No. Pull your pants up, man. Get on back out there, man. Do what you got to do. You ain't going to no infirmary. It is what it is. Was I proud of some of the things I had to do? No. I did it to survive. I'll do it again. It was what it was. That's how we looked at it. At Lucasville. You didn't go to the officers to tell nobody. You didn't go to the administration. You didn't go to your buddies. They couldn't do nothing for you. Pull your pants up, man. Man up. That's what they told you. Man up. It was what it was. So when you hear these stories about shanks and, and Anthony Parton's conduct, Anthony Parton adapted to where he was. He was in the jungle. That was the jungle. So I adapted. I adapted. I didn't do a good job at it, but I, I did what I had to do to survive, to make it up out of there. And I said, if I walk out of here, no matter what, no matter what, the day I walked out of prison, no matter what happened, no matter what I endured, I made it. I don't care how much time they took from me, I made it. All I wanted to do was just make it out of there. And when I got out, did nobody give me nothing. I didn't get no programs. I got $75 and a bus ticket back to where I came from. The inner cities of Columbus, Ohio, the North End, the projects. To a mother that didn't have nothing. Sister was on crack. Brother was on crack. I walked everywhere I went. I couldn't get no job. Every job I got, my background, we got to let you go. Got to let you go, man. You're a good worker, but we got to let you go. Dr. Stinson said it didn't surprise him that I'm here today. Don't surprise me. Don't surprise me. But they, if I blame Anthony Barr, you can blame me. I made choices. The choices I made, I blame those choices. I made those choices. I, I, I never said I did. I made the choices I made in life. Some of them was bad, some of them was good. But I, I, I made a lot of bad choices in my life. But people blame you. You can blame me for that. And Dr. Stinson told me when I talked to him, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to open up to people. I, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at that. This is the first time that anybody has ever probably, I, I've never even told my mother some of the stuff I'm telling you today. Never. I was too ashamed of it. But like I said, nobody gave me nothing. No programs. No nothing. When I got out of prison, it was back to where I came from. My life was hell. My daddy, like I said, my daddy was hell. He was hell. He was, he was, he was hell. I'm happy my daddy is gone. I'm happy. I'm, I, I'm happy he is gone. And like I said, 
some of the choices I made was just terrible. And some I'll never, never forget. One of my counselors told me, he said, Anthony, you don't plan to fail. You keep failing the plan. I want to tell you, hey, what if I ain't got no plans? What if I ain't got no plans? Then what am I going to do? I'm destined to fail anyway. I ain't got no plans. Plans to do what? To do what? What am I going to do? I'm a sex offender. Nobody want me living next door to them. You wouldn't want me living next to you. So what plans do I got? I ain't got no plans. I ain't got no plans. I never did have a plan. It was come out and do whatever you do. And just hope you make it. Like I said, I'm not asking you to accommodate my physical scars. I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm asking you to don't look past them. I told my attorney the other day, I said, you know what? <laughs> Members and ladies of the jury, if you take a dog, if you take a puppy, go buy your puppy. Go buy your puppy. Please, go buy your puppy. And put him in your backyard for 38 years. 38 years, take him in your backyard. And one day on the 38 years, take him in your house. I ain't got to tell you what he's going to do. I ain't got to tell you what he's going to do. But I'll ask you this. When he do what he do in that, be understanding. Because you helped create that. That's what you created when you left him out there for 38 years. So I respect any decision that you made and any decision that you will make. And like I said, I wish we could meet under different circumstances, but it is what it is. And that's the story of Anthony Park. That's, that's, that's me. Boss the home, at boss the home. The people didn't care about me. All they cared about was they get the check. That's all they cared about. As long as that check was rolling in, it was all good. As soon as I wouldn't comply with telling lies to the council to get more money, to get more food stamps, out I went. You got to go from here, buddy. You got to go. You know, I, I feel failed. The prison system failed me. Social service failed me. Everybody. I just wanted you to know the me. I didn't want you to keep hearing it from everybody else. I wanted you to hear it from together. They went through it. I was the guy that went through it. Not them, not these people here, not you. So can't nobody tell a story like I'm telling it. And I, I don't have nothing out there for them. Like I said, I respect any decision that you've already made and any decision that you have to make. I know you'd rather be out there doing other things than sitting here listening to me. But I wanted you to hear straight from me. Forget what everybody else told you. I'm telling you what it is. And I'm telling you how it was and what I went through. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Stephen L. McIntyre, Thank you, everyone. You may be Uh, this is my first opportunity to say well, now good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's my understanding that you have reached a verdict in this phase. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Ms. Tucker. Verdict form, <clears throat> excuse me, 1B, 
we the jury being deadlocked and uh, un unable to agree on whether the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors beyond reasonable doubt, hereby unanimously return the following life sentence, uh, life imprisonment without parole, and what appear to be 12 signatures. Uh, verdict 3B, uh, we the jury being deadlocked and un unable to agree on whether the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors beyond reasonable doubt, hereby unanimously return the following life sentence on count three, life imprisonment without parole and what appear to be 12 signatures. We the jury being deadlocked and un unable to agree on whether the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors beyond reasonable doubt, hereby unanimously return the following life sentence on count five, life imprisonment without parole and what appear to be 12 signatures. Uh, verdict 9, excuse me, 7 B. Uh, we, the jury being deadlocked and unable to agree on whether the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt, hereby unanimously return the following life sentence on count 7, life imprisonment without parole, and again, what appear to be 12 signatures. Verdict 9 B. We, the jury being deadlocked and unable to agree on whether the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating factors beyond a reasonable doubt, hereby unanimously return the following life sentence on count nine, life imprisonment without parole, and what appear to be 12 signatures. All the verdict forms are dated uh, today's date, the 20th of February. Uh, either side wish the jurors to be polled. Uh, state is not on, uh, state just would uh, thank the jury for their service in this case. All right, on behalf of the defendant. Your Honor, uh, the defense feels the same way. We do not wish the jurors to be polled. We would like to also thank the jurors for their service. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.